Today we're going to do the uh, test three exam prep. Basically, test three covers the digestive tract, which I call the GR gastrointestinal, reproductive, both male and female, and development. And so you'll be getting a, a copy of a old exam, and I call that a test three A and P two sample exam. And uh, why don't we take a look at a few questions. My name is Mark Van Cura. Uh, right above you, you're looking at Marco Rabazzo. I teach the class and Marco is the technician and the videographer and he's actually kind of a student actually here today. So let's start out. And which one do you want me to start with? Uh, let's take a there? look at, yeah. Um... Well, let's do that first one. The Mary never Our, had her first uh, Mary never had period. her first menstrual period. So let's see. First thing we want to do is define what that really means. You know, so the word when you say amenorrhea, remember A is no, so therefore it's no menses or no menstrual period. And then of course. If you said someone had primary, primary means never had menses or menstrual period. And if you have secondary amenorrhea, therefore that means you had a first period and it stopped. And of course, that first period has got a classic name from the French of called menarche. So if we take a look at that test just very quickly, it says Mary never had her first menstrual period, so that means she never had her menarche. Does she suffer from primary amenorrhea? Absolutely, right? Because she never had it. She suffers from dysmenorrhea. Well, dysmenorrhea means painful menstruation, so it can't be B. She had her menarche, no, because she never had her first menstrual period, therefore it can't be A and C, and then it says she has secondary amenorrhea, which we said, remember, secondary, I've had my first menstrual period, and it stopped, so therefore it can't be E, so A is the right answer. What next one do you want me to take um, a look at? Um, let's scroll down to number four. Number four. The teratogens. Okay. See the word here, it says teratogens. Or teratogens. Right? That's fine. Go. Well, a <laughs> remember, just teratogen is really defined as anything that causes or leads to a malformation. And that can be radiation, that can be an antibiotic, that can be a medication. There's so many different things that can cause malformations. So now we just kind of look at it and say, well, let's see. If I took a teratogen and I was pregnant, could it result in abnormal development? Well, that sounds true, right? Because it certainly could, so that's a true statement. It includes thalidomide. Actually, that's true because thalidomide was actually the first one that really coined the term. It was actually given to women for morning sickness and it turned out that kids were born without limbs. And then of course there is this word can affect the phenotype and the phenotype is how the genes are expressed, what the child looks like. So phenotype, how genes express. And therefore, the correct answer there is it going to be what? Well, it's going to be all of those. So it's A, B, and C. What's another one you want to take a look at? Uh, uh, let's take a look at number 12. Um, number 12. Just the difference between endocrine and exocrine. All right. So number 12 says... The exocrine, the endocrine pancreas secretes a bicarbonate-rich fluid, number 12. Well, so all we have to do there is say to ourselves, we've got the endocrine. Remember, endocrine equals ductless. 
and the endocrine pancreas is going to secrete insulin and glucagon. And then the exocrine pancreas is going to be ducted and that's going to secrete HCO3 which is bicarbonate and plus amylase which is an enzyme to break down starches. So where it says the endocrine pancreas secretes a bicarbonate rich fluid that's going to be false because it's actually the exocrine secretes it. What's another one? Could you, you move take a just to at? see your, your notes there? Yeah, there we okay. go. Any other one you don't know? Um, let's see here. Uh, I was taking a look at the number 25. 25 says the umbilical vein contains maternal blood. That's an interesting question, and the reason why I say it's interesting because just think of it very simply that if I drew a diagram and say here was the mom and here was her uterus and the uterus had a lining called the endometrium and this is the fetus sitting over here and remember sitting between the mother and the fetus is going to be this fetal lung that we call the placenta. And that placenta is going to directly attach to the endometrium of the mother. And this placenta is going to then go to the umbilical vein, umbilical artery into the fetus. So this is, we'll say, is going to be the artery. And this is going to be the vein. So just think that the artery is going to have venous blood so it's going to send venous blood from the fetus to the placenta to get oxygenated the umbilical vein is going to have arterial blood that got oxygenated by the placenta so if we go back to the question and it says the umbilical vein contains maternal blood well, if you look at the diagram here, it certainly doesn't because remember the umbilical vein and artery have got fetal blood. So therefore that's false. And you can just see that blood in these two vessels never went into the mother. What's another one you want me okay. to take a look at? Um, taking a look at uh, number 27, that true number false 27. question. Yeah. And number 27, it says, what the blastocyst normally implants in the uterus all right always think very simply you'll see in any textbook there's a very simple diagram that you can always look at but just remember if i do a very quick drawing here to show the structures that we're doing here and these are here's your ovary and here's your fimbria and here's your ovary and this is going to be your cervix here and so therefore, just think that I'm going to have a sperm and that's going to enter up through the uterus and then end its way down in here. Coming from the ovary is going to be the ova. And so where the sperm and the ova meet, it's going to form something called a zygote. And then what's going to happen is that zygote is going to travel and if it's a normal fertilization and implantation it's actually going to implant somewhere here inside of the uterus in the endometrium of the uterus so what's going to implant is going to be the blastocyst so just think a sperm and an form of zygote zygote matures into a so that's fertilization is what occurred here and then that sperm and that ova are going to actually turn into the uh, the sperm and the ova are going to go into the zygote that's fertilization and then after about two weeks they're going to implant is something called the blastocyst 
Could you move the page just to your right a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So then if we look at the question, and the question number 27, it says the blastocyst normally implants in the uterus. Well, the blastocyst, that's true. That's going to implant. So that's absolutely true. Okay. Any other question you need? Uh, let's take a look at... Um, look at number 35. 35, all right. So we take a look at question 35. 35 is talking about something called the Whipple procedure. And it says the Whipple procedure is used for advanced pancreatic cancer. Well, that's actually a true statement. It's actually a treatment for advanced pancreatic cancer. And I think it's important to understand another name for a Whipple procedure. So a Whipple procedure is actually a pancreato duodenectomy. So just by looking at those names, ectomy member is to remove something. And so what you're going to do is you're going to remove the head of the pancreas. And then you're going to remove the duodenum. Remember that's that nine inch section of the small intestine. You're going to remove the gallbladder. And then you're going to remove the bile duct. And you're going to bypass those structures. As a general rule, it's a, sometimes a little bit of a life extension tool. But uh, at the end of the day, I would say it probably causes more damage than good. So you might as well, if you've got pancreatic cancer, you want to live the best that you can with the very little time that you have remaining. Is there another one you'd like to take a look at? Yeah, uh, let's take a look at um, number 38. 38. 38 says, parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor into the stomach. Well, let's see, parietal cells are actually found in the stomach. They do secrete hydrochloric acid. They do secrete intrinsic factor and therefore into the stomach. And that's true. That's a true statement. Just remember, hydrochloric acid is going to be used to break down food. But intrinsic factor, remember, is going to be used to absorb vitamin B12. So that's the significance of parietal cells. Any other questions you want me to take a look um, at? Yeah, 45. 45? Yeah. All right, so let's see what 45 looks like. And again, if you go through all these questions, you'll see that they're very, very straightforward. There's not much very serious critical thinking as understanding. 45 says PKU patients need to avoid Splenda. Well, just remember Splenda really equals sucralose. So those are those yellow packets that you use. They're actually a modified sugar that have no caloric intake. PKU stands for Remember, P is for the, uh, met the uh, thing called phenylalanine. So therefore, it stands for phenyl ketone urea. So it's a genetic disease. It's because it's got a defect in the liver pathway for the breakdown of phenylalanine, which is an essential amino acid. And therefore, phenyl ketone uric patients they have to avoid phenylalanine. And so they don't have to avoid Splenda. They would have to avoid the little blue packets of, of uh, sugar, which contains phenylalanine. So therefore when you, you know, 
go and get your sugars, you'll see there's a little pink packets and the pink packets are actually going to be the, the old uh, one that came out in the 70s and that for, for sugar and that. They were a synthetic sugar that tasted horrible. Was that sweet and low? That was sweet and low. And then you had the little blue packets that came out. And the little blue packets, the ones that had aspartame, and aspartame actually is phenylalanine, and so that's what you've got to avoid when you uh, are a PKU patient. If you don't avoid it, problem is you can go into liver failure, have brain damage, and literally could kill you. Any other questions you want? Yeah, to I was at? flipping through in uh, number eighty-eight. Number eighty-eight. All right, so let's take a look at 88. And 88, it says that the cardiac sphincter is also called the lower esophageal sphincter. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, the cardiac sphincter or lower esophageal sphincter, just think that if my esophagus is coming down, it's actually passing through the diaphragm. So this is the E for esophagus. This is the D for the diaphragm. And it's gonna pass into my S for the stomach. And so therefore right here is where I've got my thing called the LES or the lower esophageal sphincter. And it actually got its name because probably 75 to 80% of patients that come in the emergency room complaining of chest pain, really that chest pain feels like it's chest pain, but in effect it's probably reflux passing up through the lower esophageal sphincter, and hence it's got its name as the cardiac sphincter. So angina pectoris is really often presents as chest pain, but it really comes more than 75% of the time from acid reflux or GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Any other questions you want to take? Uh, the only that? last one I had was uh, for number 98. 98? Yeah. 98 says the gametes are haploid cells. Well, remember, haploid cells means that they have 23 chromosomes. Remember, 23 chromosomes is called the N number. And remember, the gametes are going to be a sperm and an ova. And sure enough, if a sperm's got 23 and an ova's got 23, 23 and 23 is 46, and 46 equals a zygote, and that goes on to mature into a blastocyst, a fetus, and eventually an infant. So therefore, that's the significance of haploid versus a diploid cell. Remember, a diploid cell is just 46 chromosomes, or a body cell or somatic cell, and that's going to be the 2N number. Any other questions on that? Those are the only ones that... All right, yeah. so remember, for the test, what you want to do is you want to go through those 100 questions. You'll see that as you're going through those questions, a lot of them are directly like this diagram here. It's directly out of the textbook. You're also going to see this diagram here as questions on. They're directly out of the textbook. So those are things you want to memorize for your future careers. And then I also sent you a paper, which is basically a paper about endoscopy in that and you'll see that in the test itself there's actually a set of questions that actually are directly from that paper and so those are the questions that you're going to want to go through and answer so you'll see that I think there's 10 questions or so that are directly from the endoscopy paper well that's kind of an overview of what you've got to study for the third exam uh, I hope you've enjoyed the class and I hope you've enjoyed this material and uh, have a great day. Thank you.